Welcome to Edge of the Rabbit Hole. I'm Mike Ricksecker, author and ghost story, with my co-host Vanessa Holgo. And uh, well, our chat shenanigator Shauna is not down there in chat this evening, unfortunately. She is working tonight. I guess I have a parade and, and all of that where she's at. So uh, she got sucked into that. So Donna Gorton, I expect is one of our Cheshire cats will be picking that up this evening. I haven't really had a chance to check the chat yet. So with us tonight is Dr. Heather Lynn, and uh, I'm really excited for this show, Vanessa. I know you are too. Me so, too. Yeah, because I've, I've read some of her books in the past when I used to work in Washington, D.C., riding the Metro, and she was one of those authors that I read on that long ride down there. So, uh, Dr. Heather Lynn is an author, historian, and renegade archaeologist on a quest to uncover the truth behind ancient mysteries. She holds numerous degrees and certificates in both history and archaeology and is a member of professional organizations including the American Historical Association, the Society for Historical Archaeology, Association of Ancient Historians, and the World Archaeological Congress. She left a life in academia to pursue her fascination with the unexplained and now investigates ancient mysteries, lost civilizations, hidden history, ancient aliens, and the occult. Heather's work exposes our hidden history, challenging the accepted narrative found in mainstream history books. In addition to appearances on radio programs like Coast to Coast, Heather has been a historical consultant for television programs, including History's Ancient Aliens. And you can check out uh, her website, uh, drheatherlynn.com. So, Dr. Heather Lynn, welcome. <laughs> Appreciate having you Hi. on here. <laughs> oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, absolutely. And you and Vanessa were having a heck of a conversation before we went live. I just wanted to like hit the start stream button and just let it roll right then and there. I know, right? Van <laughs> Vanessa has right great in. questions. I want to dive right in. Go for okay, it. Okay, I do. Take away, um, Vanessa. Um, for everyone watching, Heather and I were discussing um, the difference between and what is depicted in some of the hieroglyphs and, and different things that have been out there concerning mental illness and demonic possession. But the one thing that I am truly fascinated by and, and super interested in is you hear, especially in our field, in what Mike and I do, um, you hear about objects being haunted or possessed or having some type of spiritual attachment to it. And you can hear these just otherworldly stories about things that happen with that. And I would love to know your honest opinion on that as... I, I've seen it myself. I've seen some of the examples of that. I've seen it happen with myself, but I'm not really sure where the origins are coming from. Do you believe that's possible? You know, that's something that I have been exploring in great detail when researching my book, Evil Archaeology. I actually uh, reached out to Mike to ask him his thoughts because I am not a paranormal researcher or anything like that. I, I have my, well, I, I would like to say I have my, you know, feet firmly planted on the ground, but that's actually not so true since I do kind of, you know, explore all alternative ideas. So I reached out to Mike to ask him his thoughts on these things because it's something that, you know, I'm wondering myself. I've read so many different accounts of, you know, cursed objects and, you know, but it, it, as far as I know, I've not seen anything, you know, I, I'm very skeptical, let's just say that. So but you had an <laughs> like that. I have not personally had, um, well, not with an object. No, I've had some strange, <laughs> I've, I've had some strange um, things happen, but nothing with any kind of um, object. Yeah, I'm not really, you know, like I said, I'm a little skeptical, you know, a little bit. I'm, I'm highly curious, which is why I investigate. And I enjoy speaking to people who, you know, make it their mission to go out and really look into these sorts of things. But as far as I know, I... I haven't experienced anything, um, although I think I, <laughs> I, I wouldn't test it, though. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I guess there's a little superstition in me left still from being raised Catholic. So, you know, if but somebody told goes. me here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So, like, I don't you know. think it's so much as superstition as it is future self-preservation, because, I mean, let's think about that. It, that's our inner, our inner self warning us, hey, I'm not saying this could happen. But mm -hmm. <laughs> if there's a possibility, let's not go down that road, you know, but that would have to be for somebody like myself that I, I mean, I, I can get bombarded by, by things. I mean, I don't know if Mike told you or not, but, but I'm a medium. So I have, um, 
I have that connection already. As fascinated as I am by what you do, part of me is fearful. Well, and I thought that this would be a interest, really interesting discussion between the two of you because, Heather, I know that you're currently working on uh, psychic archaeology and using mediums to help locate certain artifacts. Yeah, that's something um, a little uh, unusual, I guess, that I've been doing. Um, but, you know, more, more to your point with the, the fear, I, I was reminded of an Aristotle quote of... Uh, very simple fear is pain arising from the anticipation of evil so you know maybe there's some truth to that so maybe <laughs> but you know in terms of what I've been doing lately uh, you know uh, there are a lot of limitations to what we can do in archaeology uh, not necessarily for you know technology sake or anything but just actual rules and mostly I should say funding so I'm in Northeast Ohio, and there, there's a uh, site that uh, Mike might be familiar with. It's called Indian Point. Yeah. Um, it contains the remains of a prehistoric Native American earthen enclosure. Um, it was actually named after a for the former property owner, so it's called the Lyman Site. Right now it's a uh, park. And so you can go and, you know, jog and, and walk through and see, and it's very beautiful. But what's interesting about the site is it contains two earthen walls that are bordered by ditches. And so there's steep cliffs, and it was used as like a, a barrier, kind of like a fort. And so the archaeologists, they've, they've dug up some things there. They got, you know, just typical things you'd expect, some tools, pipes, beads. Um, but but what's, what fascinated me when I saw it was that uh, well, first of all, the people that were there, they're called the they're referred to as the Whittlesey people. Um, and and that's not because of who they were so much as who discovered them. So that right there was sort of interesting that, you know, there was a guy in the 1800s, Whittlesey, you know, a very important guy around here. Um, he was an Ohio geologist who mapped their sites and, and many others. Um, but that was pretty much it. He discovered this and moved on. And since then, not many people have been researching them. The, what's interesting to me was this particular site, um, Whittlesey thought might have been either a village or a ceremonial center that people would travel to in order to do, you know, possibly sacrifices or, or offerings or something like that, which would make it a very important site. But mm. the evidence um, shows that in about, they, I think, roughly 1650, um, the culture just disappeared and they have no idea why, how, what happened. They just disappeared. And so nothing was going on with that site. And I thought, yeah, it's, it's interesting. So I had just, you know, done a little bit of land reconnaissance to see if there were any landmarks or features that would indicate some other human activity. And uh, in a typical excavation, the next step would be like test pitting to help find where most of the artifacts are so that, you know, every few meters or so you could, uh, you know, dig a test square to see if you could you know, it's sort of like a game of hot and cold. The more artifacts you find in the test squares, you know, the closer you're getting to the center of the site, which is where you'd want to f start the full-scale excavation, obviously, because you're going to find the most things that way. So that's not something that was possible in this particular site since it is a, um, a park. You know, it's... Uh, <laughs> The universities aren't really interested in it. There's no funding for it. Mm -hmm. When I was in school here, I went to... a Cleveland State, and uh, I actually had to transfer because they dropped my program. Oh, they wow. ended up, uh, I, yeah, so this shows you the support for archaeology was not really there. Yeah. And so, and that's not just the case here, it's something that's happening everywhere. There's been a lot of, you know, uh, emphasis on different things, and the liberal arts and, and, and whatnot are kind of falling to the side. So, as a result of that, you know, it's just, it's indicative of the kind of, um, I guess lack of interest, lack of money, lack of funding. So this happened and there's no follow-up. So it's just sort of this really interesting site. Well, I I was walking around and I, I did some, you know, off-trail hiking and I found what I believe to be possibly evidence that it was in fact a, you know, important ceremonial center. And and I believe there is if 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 somebody would excavate, if it would be possible, I believe that there would be a um, a pyramid there, oh, and wow. so this this would be one of the um, you know only pyramids of its kind um, in the area. Um, the, there's would be one similar that's uh, located in a, in a uh, you know uh, 
Cl- there, there's a lot, actually. You know, the mound builders, um, mm-hmm. people are very familiar with that. They're mostly found in, you know, mid and southern Ohio. and, and uh, Right, like so Newark the, with the Great Circle Earthworks sure, and all that, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And so a lot of people just kind of forget or don't consider that, hey, you know, up here there could be something. <laughs> um, and so there's a lot of, of things, you know, about this area that would really you know, make me think, hey, there's something here and it needs to be excavated. So not had much luck getting anywhere with that. And, you know, I've not pressed the issue too much. But then somebody suggested something to me and I thought, huh, they said, why don't you go up there with a psychic? And I thought, oh, that's so funny. There you Maybe go. I could. Maybe I could. <laughs> <laughs> why I not? <laughs> um, I have a question for you based on the site. You said that there are two walls. Is that correct? Um, yeah, basically. They, There's actually more. There's mounds, but like they, you go up as you're walking. Um, it, it sort of like goes up and up and up. And there's there's these. I mean, they're very beautiful. They're they're big mounds. But if you were to walk up on the mound and look over, it's a huge wall drop off down to some water. Um, are they perpendicular or parallel? Parallel. Parallel. Okay. And uh, what direction is the open area between the two? Uh, it runs um, east and east west. And west. Yes. Uh-oh. Okay. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> Here it comes. Kinda... Here it comes. <laughs> yeah. have, have you checked what would be considered downwind from this particular area? Uh, as for as much as I can legally, as of now, yes. Okay. Yes. And uh, I, yeah. Yeah. About yeah. 40 to 60 feet. From the base <laughs> out. You're, you're spooking me out. <laughs> She'll narrow it right down for you, yeah. That, is, that, that is where what what their trash or cast-offs or mm-hmm. things that they considered no longer important mm-hmm. would have been put. Um, broken pieces of, of, of pottery, and I don't mean that it, that it got broke after the fact. Uh, it, it, that would be where their waste would have been. Mm-hmm. And so more could actually be be found out from them by that. But here's the thing. Just a little bit of ways from that is also where you're going to find um, the uh, the bones. The bones. Um, wow. Both human and animal. Um, and the bones are going to show um, a deterioration in them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I would really be interested in knowing... If at any point in time there were high levels of, um, and I don't know if this is a thing or not, but is arsenic natural? Yes. Okay. High levels of arsenic. Wow. In that area. Mm-hmm. In the soil. Um, if you could actually do any type of ground test, uh, go through and do a cylinder test and go down and pull out a core sample. Mm-hmm. And if you uh, if you could do one about three feet deep, three three to four feet deep, um, you'll find that the the lower down on the core sample is going to have higher levels of arsenic in it. And wow. that, yeah, and that would cause bone deterioration as well. Mm-hmm. Wow, <laughs> that's. I'm gonna have to try to, to check that one out. I think I will. <laughs> yeah. I really do because I thought you know. Somebody mentioned it, and I, I thought, oh, wouldn't that be funny? And then I thought, that's actually not funny. That what could it hurt? It couldn't hurt anything. And exactly. so, and then I well, was reminded. The scenario were wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we do have a uh, ten dollars super chat from Tom McNicholas. He, sa- he says, "Sorry, I'm late. Happy Tuesday." So, thank you very much, Tom McNicholas. Do appreciate that. Woohoo! Right. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to bun- to jump oh, in no. on that. But when you started describing it, I could not see it. Could you see it? Oh, wow. That's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, because that's what I was asking. I'm like, because I see them side by side. I don't see them perpendicular. Yeah. It's almost, yeah, it's, it's like you're walking up a hill and then it's just drop. Everything just drops. Um, and it's weird because I see what looks, to, now I'm, I'm short, so to me it looks like a mountain. <laughs> but, right, uh, right. It's like <laughs> mountains and the, those uh, evergreen and cypress trees in the distance. Wow. Like if you go up top and you were to yeah. look, that's what's in the distance. Well, I have to say there, it's the whole area has very large hemlock trees. So that's something really noticeable about it. You walk through and there's hemlock everywhere. That's <laughs> wow. Yeah. So 
you made Woo-hoo! me believe. You made so, me believe in some yeah. things. <laughs> I'm a believer. So, this is how, how much have you been incorporating that now uh, with with the use of psychics? You know, just just I've been dabbling, mm-hmm. for lack of better word. I've been I've been looking into you know that where I can, and I I, I was inspired by a story of uh, actually. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be the first person to do this. I was inspired by a story I heard of a man named Frederick Bly Bond. He went by the name of Bly. Hmm. He was an English architect and archaeologist and psychic researcher during the, um, you know, like the time of spiritualism and that kind of thing in the 1800s. Okay. And so he he <laughs> he was uh, he was actually hired to uh, research Glastonbury Abbey. And so he was had a legit job, you know, doing legit things. He was actually fired, though, by the Church of England for um, using automatic writing and psychic archaeology to help him locate all the things that he did. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So he he later he you know he kind of said, well, to heck with that, and then he went and joined the Masons and the <laughs> Theosophical Society, and he founded a paranormal research group. And he just went all out because you know he had. He and his buddy went around and, and they practiced psychic archaeology and it was actually working and he was renowned as this wonderful archaeologist and he was amazing and he got this great position from the Church of England and, and then when they found out of course that this is how he was doing it they were like oh that's not that's not cool goodbye you're fired right. and uh, but but the but the fact remained he you know in his journals and different things he did automatic writing and he would he would draw where the the artifacts would be mm. and they would be accurate. It was so accurate. I thought, yeah. yeah, they were accurate. That's, and that's what I do, and it works really well. That, if, yeah, because Vanessa be. draws. Vanessa will will draw uh, fantastic illustrations. Yeah, oh. and it's all based on psychic impressionism. So, yeah. but yeah. it's it's and it works. It's things like this, like the use of psychics and some of your mm-hmm. different viewpoints. It's basically gotten you considered to be a renegade archaeologist because it's it it's butting up against that mainstream that you know they're trying to get people to adhere to absolutely that's <laughs> yeah that's that's pretty much what i do i i, I studied archaeology and history and you know when everything in kind of a, a legit way and i got jaded as i was in mm-hmm. the whole system um you know a lot of people are jaded but they just sort of like suck it up and take it out on their students i just got <laughs> jaded and left because but you know i have to say it wasn't really my idea to leave initially it was um, the advice of Michael Cremo. Um, uh, okay. you know, your audience might be familiar with him. He wrote uh, a really great book called Forbidden Archaeology. Mm-hmm. And it was something, you know, I was always interested in, in fringe theories. And I remember my very first archaeology class. I went in. I was so excited. I had my, you know, hundreds of dollars worth of textbooks that it was just ridiculous. You know, I go in and I'm just naive and spend all this money and so of course you go in with a bias where you're like oh this is everything they say is right it's going to be right here in this book i paid so much money for it yada yada so the first thing they say is you know what we're going to do is up here we have a list of all these different pseudo archaeologists and their fringe theories and what we need you to do for your first assignment is to play the role of debunker and i'm like okay (laughs) interesting you know so i thought well this is what academia is it's discourse you know you got to but as I looked at the names, as I, as I looked at, you know, some of that, I, I felt a little guilty and maybe a little shame because I thought, wow, I've been reading their books. Right. And I, and they sort of inspired me to go down this route. And while I didn't agree with everything, I agreed with the idea that they should be allowed to express their theories because I felt that the injection of creative and new ideas into a system like empirical research was important to sort of shake things up. Whether you go in that direction or not, I think that, you know, what was happening was this closed society where all new ideas were just not accepted. And I thought, well, you know, let's throw something wild in there. And if it gets somebody interested, then so so be it. So that was like kind of red flag number one. Red flag number two was when um, my anthropology uh, advisor said, you know, we have, we're have we having a problem. We're going to lose our funding and our, our lab is going to get closed because no one's signing up for our anthropology course what are we going to do and i was like i know what to do and so we went to the museum and there was this archaeology day and you know i made all this um you know print collateral and i'm no artist or anything but i made these fun sort of you know flyers that had like a spooky skull on it and different things And i was saying come on and you know explore this and whatever they used them because it was printed at the last minute they didn't they didn't know and they just afterwards they said to me 
you know, we really weren't a big fan of how you portrayed our program. And I was like, what? I didn't portray it in any kind of wild, fantastic way. And they said, well, we don't like to sensationalize what we do because it draws in too many people with their wild ideas. And I'm thinking, oh, wow. well, first of all, these are young people. You're the, the, the idea was to get them interested, pull them yeah. in, let them sign up, and then they can see for themselves. And you want new people and not – you don't want to invite people into your class that have bias already, confirmation bias. Mm -hmm. You're just creating a bubble then for yourselves. And so they weren't, they weren't my biggest fan. And then once I got more involved into the, the working there, um, I found that there was so much corruption. It just was really terrible. There was, you know, everything <coughs> from soap opera-style corruption, people sleeping their way to the top and doing whatever – and people sabotaging each other for jobs and just right. basic things like that, all the way to things like, um, you know, hiding research, hiding. Oh wow! They just said, yeah. And and this was small. This wasn't like Harvard or something. Mm -hmm. This was. This all started at, um, you know, at a small community college. Right. And so I. And they're thought, even this hiding stuff at that level. Yeah, so because wow. I, you know, I went there, and then I went back to work there while I was still yeah. completing my bachelor's. And so I'm working there, and I was like, okay, now you're on the inside. Help us get grant money because that's all they really cared about. Oh, jeez. And I just really got into thinking, wow, this is really – and so I got a little jaded that way. But I still thought, well, this is just some corrupt little school. Once I get up <laughs> into the graduate level stuff, you know, then it'll be fine. It probably and got no, worse, it was, right? It got worse. Yeah. <laughs> it got worse. And so when I started doing more research into larger archaeological mm -hmm. sites that I would like to maybe participate in, you know, research and excavation around the world, I saw something that disgusted me to the point beyond all hope. And I wrote that was what I wrote my first um, book. That's about, a Sumerian controversy, right? That's a Sumerian controversy. Yeah. And that book um, really goes into what I found um, about. Uh, who funds some of these big sites. And that's something, you know, I referred to earlier with this, you know, Indian Point area. And it sounded like that, that got you in a bit of trouble. That got me in a lot of trouble. Yeah. <laughs> that got me in a lot, in, in so much trouble that my follow-up book, Land of the Watchers, mm -hmm. is not available on Amazon anymore. And Which I'm not I allowed noticed, to have yeah. it on Amazon. You're not allowed to have it yeah. on Amazon at all. No, they, it's it's on there, but don't anyone buy it because it says it's like fifty dollars or something because somebody. Oh no, it was like eight hundred or something like that when oh, I looked it goodness. up. Yeah, it was crazy. Yes, it's it's don't, yeah. So nobody buy that. That's a yeah. rip off. That's insane. But yes, what what started happening? I re I I started out very naive still, like oh this is just you know la 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 until I got hit hard with the facts and the facts were that there are huge players in these excavations. It has become something beyond political. It is a global. You know, I hate to use the term yeah. like global cabal, but it really is because they have. You were finding that oil companies were heavily yes, involved with this, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And that's what it was. They have oil companies. And now, for, you know, like I said, it, it, it's hard to get money for these digs. So, you know, there's that. But then what you're seeing is on this larger scale, where are they getting the money? They're getting the money from huge multinational mm -hmm. corporations like oil companies and people who have vested and you know interests in these regions like in the middle east and you know and and you know you can argue to the point well somebody has to pay for it etc but my problem wasn't really that as much as it was not just a company it was what they were doing with the artifacts and the individuals behind it so for instance you had gulf sands petroleum funding an excavation of um, near the ancient city of ur and in addition to who, you know, their funding, it was an individual. It was, you know, a, a Baron von Thyssen, part of the German uh. Thyssen family, you know, corrupt <laughs> bunch of, you know, um, no Nazis, you know, for lack of better term. I mean, that sounds outrageous. It sounds like some, you know, cheap Indiana well, Jones trope. <laughs> but, you know, th that's legit history where, yeah, back, especially during World, World War II with Hitler, he was looking for these objects of power. So that's, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, for that to well, still be going on today, I'm not surprised. Well, Thyssen, what he was doing was he actually collects these artifacts for his own enjoyment. Mm -hmm. So there's a problem right there because he uh, is funding this search. So the thing is, he's going there. He's funding it. We aren't allowed to go there. It takes all kinds of resources and protection to go to these sites. And it's very, you know, it's geopolitical. It's dangerous. So they have the resources to do that. So what they do is they go, and this is what got me in trouble, by outing the fact that they take the good stuff first. Mm -hmm. They hide it in their own personal museums and libraries and living rooms. 
and then they take the little pot shards and the little things and whatever. And now they, here you can have these scraps, right? You can have these scraps for yeah. research. And plus, oh, we're not done looking, so please fund us some more, and we'll just mm -hmm. make this our job because the pr the professor's number one priority, unfortunately, um, is to preserve their job because it's you know grants. So it's all about making money so you have a, a, a job to go to tomorrow. And so they get caught up in the cycle, and it's really awful. And what happens is uh, our our artifacts, things that are important to our collective culture are just gone and it leaves huge gaps in the research. So there's so many times where people are like, well, if we only knew, or if we only had the answers and those answers are out there and they're not still buried, they're in somebody's living room because they're rich and better than us. And that's what the problem I had with the whole thing was. And when I started publishing and, and talking out about it, <laughs> that's when I had a lot more problems. And that's when I quickly woke up to the fact that, okay, I'm either, um, I'm either in this or I'm not. I can't really, you know, be in both worlds. I have to take a, a pick. And so that's, I guess, technically what made me the renegade. Mm -hmm. As I said, I'm out of here. I'm doing, yeah. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going it alone. And now, you know what, as a bonus, I get to check out things like psychic archaeology. There you go. Or, you know, just some <laughs> alternative viewpoints just because why not? Yeah, we have yeah, a, uh, hang on just a second, okay. Vanessa. We have a uh, $10 super chat from Mickey Dole says, happy Tuesday. And then oh, Dawn, Spooky Spectacular, is saying that Heather is the female Indiana Jones. Absolutely. <laughs> now, Heather, I have a question for you. I used to watch, and I cannot for the life of me remember his name, nor would I probably be able to pronounce it. But do you remember... Uh, watching a bunch of the digs and excavations of the burial sites in Egypt and that main guy that did all the shows. I want to say it was on HBO. Mm, I don't know. They've made so many shows like that. So I don't yeah, know about he that was particular about, one, I think. He was about, oh, there were multiples. There were multiples. And I want to say he was about eight or nine years ago. Um, now, here's my thing. As fascinated as I am, by all of that and and the the pharaohs and everything else in Egypt and and what might or might not lie in those tombs part of me feels like certain things like that are are beyond touching and it's made me wonder based on what you've said how much of that stuff that was shown on TV that you know was national treasures so to speak out of these tombs that never expected to see the light of day you said you know those end up in certain people's living rooms and stuff like that is there a chance that with those objects or with anything that may or may not have been taken out of those that there could be any type of, of negative force attached to that um, I, I hesitate to use the word curse but I do know it didn't end well for that guy <laughs> okay. um, yeah I think that I mean it's possible I don't rule anything out really I, I would because you know I think it's foolish for somebody to say oh no that could never be when we live in a world of you know who knows so I can't really come out there and say no absolutely not it's 100% impossible but in terms of like these curses um, you know like the, the mummy's curse is like the, a very famous one uh it was determined, I think, in 2006 that one of the reasons that everybody died after opening the tomb was simply that they had unleashed a uh, deadly microbe, you know. So, you know, it seemed, and, and at the time, they didn't realize that because, you know, it was, it was a while back. And so they didn't even think about that or consider it. And um, so people started dying and, and, you know, there's that. So... There are bad things that can happen. I know things like the mummy's curse have been sort of debunked, at least to some extent. Um, but, you know, I guess you never know because we live in a strange, strange world. So I wouldn't I would I wouldn't I wouldn't say no, but I've not found any evidence uh, to support that. Uh, but again, that's not me saying no. That just is me saying I don't really know. <laughs> a couple <laughs> couple things from the chat. One for you, Vanessa. Uh, Mickey Dole is saying that that was uh, Zahi Hawass, the uh, director of antiquities out there. There you go. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. Um, for Thank you, you Dr. Heather, uh, Kathy Cilianto is saying you go, Dr. Lynn. Keep up the awesome work. 
Oh, thank you. I'm trying. Sometimes it's, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes Amazon makes it difficult, but I found right. ways around that. So, you know. Well, I mean, have, have you found yourself being an archaeologist wanting to excavate certain things and believing that we should for the knowledge that they could bring, but also on the same token, believing that some things should be left alone? Or do you do you think that, that it all should be explored? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know... I, curiosity probably, killed the probably cat probably the response exactly <laughs> i know right so the probably the responsible answer would be i think we should leave stuff but no i think it's it's all fair game let's just go we need to find <laughs> out what's there i want to be there i want to see what's there we need to research it and we need to know and it shouldn't be done by people who are looking to have it as like you know fun pieces of artwork in there as a paper yeah, no, I, I love investigating everything but there's <laughs> in some cases i believe like human remains at some point you know they were they were buried oh, someplace absolutely. so they should eventually be put back i mean do your human research remains, but put it back. yeah human remains are different because that's a, that's a respect issue that's yeah you know those are those are human beings there's there yeah there there are lines you shouldn't cross and plus legally it's illegal to, you know, move those types of remains, at least in any, you know, in the United States, other countries as well. But we have strict guidelines in place. Uh, they're actually constitutional, you know, policies and different things going through where you, it's it's pretty well clear that, no, you're not allowed to go digging up like ancient Indian burial grounds or anything like right. that. So, you know. And I think um, that and, times and, that they have, is it, where, where was it? It was somewhere out in the, um, I want to think it was Montana or Minnesota or something like that mm -hmm. um, in one of the big hills out there where they came across some ancient um, Native American remains and they did take them out to study but they did put them back respectfully yeah and I think usually you have to get permission you have to go yeah. through a lot of different channels to get permission um, you know to do that so, so it's taken very seriously and rightfully so yeah. so aside from human remains um, you know which I do think should be studied but with a certain level of respect and permission but aside from that you know, I don't want to say finders keepers. Absolutely <laughs> not, because that's Lord, that's the Von Thyssen family who just goes out and you know people like that. And plus, it's not even. I don't mean to pick on th that family, even though they were like the main bankers of the Nazi Party. So you know they <laughs> they have a big they they have a big um, history. But I don't mean to pick on them particularly because it's other people. I've actually received emails from individuals you know who shall remain nameless. Um, actually, one person in Saudi Arabia who is very wealthy who contacted me hoping that I could just help him out with, you know, curating some of his objects. And he sent me pictures <laughs> of his objects. And my goodness, I didn't even know what to say. I thought you live here. I mean, <laughs> you know, you've, you've, I've watched cribs before. I've never seen anything like this. Right. This is your house. And this is what you have. He had, he had encased in the best museum glass, he, Sumerian artifacts, tablets, things that, just should be in museums right. they were just there and in the background they he had a huge flat screen television on the wall like a theater system and then oh right beside it there's a sumerian tablet <laughs> i'm like that, people shouldn't it's live that, like this all this that is oil ridiculous money. <laughs> yes i was like wow. this is ridiculous and so i we, politely declined helping right. we do have a couple of uh questions rolling in from the chat this is from uh, Zippy Davis, one of our Deep Down the Rabbit Hole Patreon patrons. Um, Dr. Heather, have you ever gotten to see that cursed mummy they found in the ice many years ago? Uh, not personally, no. But okay. All right. <laughs> no, I, I, I've seen a, 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 the, the closest I've gotten is a documentary, so unfortunately. Okay. No. And from Andrew Cox, what do you think is under the Sphinx in Egypt? Hmm, well... <laughs> That's a great a lot one. of controversy I be, there. I, I, there is, but I, you know, I, I don't see a, a reason not to consider that there's a hall of records there. You know, if you consider the psychic archaeology that, you know, Edgar Casey, you know, sort of was involved in, at man. least well, he's the man. <laughs> well, let, let me let me ask you this. So what do you think is the true age of the Sphinx? 4,500 years, 10,000, 26,000? There's a lot of different numbers thrown out there these days. There's a lot of different numbers. And I, I, I am always suspicious in a case like this, which, which like we were talking before the show about how things are not black and white. There are definite shades of gray. And so when people start, my red flag is when people start putting out, like putting out um, actual numbers. So at this point, I would say, I don't agree with any of those numbers, um, but I do agree that it's 
older than those numbers. Yeah. I believe that it's much older. So whether it's, you know, this many thousand or that many thousand, I think that's just still up for debate and that's, you know, important to discuss and look into. But I I, I would not align myself with any of those numbers in particular no. because there's just not enough evidence um, to support one versus the other. I mean, some more than others, but it's my personal opinion that it's even older than that. Yeah, and I think I think the, the water weathering pattern kind of gives that away. And, yeah. and even then, that's still, you don't know for sure how old it is. It just means it's older. Um, but mm -hmm. that's one of those cases to me where that's, you know, from a geologist's point of view. And that basically flies in the face of the historians, which I guess is where you're coming from. You're, you know, historian, archaeologist. And it's from these other disciplines where they're saying yeah it's it's older and then your discipline i know you're the renegade so you've broken off from that but you know where that has really butted heads with with these different uh, scientific disciplines uh, yeah, absolutely and that's something that um you know it's really important it's a lesson that i really want to stress to people because a lot of times you know we're given this narrative or we think mm -hmm. we know what you know history is about um because we remember from school well school was a you know, terrible example of history because <laughs> it was basically like, here, wrote memorization, you know, take a test. What year did this happen? What year did that happen? And that is not history. If you didn't have a storyteller for a uh, history teacher, I had actually two great yes. history teachers. And the reason why they were great was because they were storytellers. Those other ones are just memorized names and dates. Forget memorized names and dates. It's enough to yeah. really put someone off on history. At least I hated it. And, mm. and I, I thought it was going to go on and be a music major because I played <laughs> instruments and sang. And so I went the whole opposite direction but that was it when I got into you know when I got out of the public school system and went into college things got a little different not the first year it was still a little you know but as I got further along and met different people and, and I started seeing that wait a second this is a little different and the, the historian's craft is really historiography which is like this kind of meta principle of the history of the history of something so most of your time is spent actually admitting that you don't know anything and what you need to do is research who researched what and compare those things and and try to find the truth among all that so it's it's, it's interesting and important but the higher truth that comes out of that is that people don't know anything there are very <laughs> few things that we have a firm grasp on like in history particularly because it is a it's it's a humanity it's not an exact science right archaeology is actually a newer invention it came out of the history of um wealthy elite people wanting to collect antiquities and they had time on their hands and money to fund things and so they went off and you know had adventures but then they they were getting a little flack because you know um revolution started happening and people were getting a little bit more like hey power to the people and started pointing them out and so what they had to do was legitimize themselves they they got into some guilds and some antiquarian societies and they started legitimizing what they viewed as a profession and in doing so they had to establish methods and, and you know in some regard that's a good thing but in others in order to survive they had to adopt more of a scientific method obviously that has benefits because you can do things now like you know ground penetrating radar and all these right. different you know uh, ways to measure things but it's it's a lie in the sense that they're portraying it as hard science when no matter how many hard scientific tools you use it still is a soft science because it takes so much interpretation you don't have the evidence you can even if you have the dates the you know all the the biological information there what happened it's right. and you so, know what they always say it's ritual it's because they don't know and they know that but again everyone's holding they're they're wanting to hold on to their jobs and positions and so they go out and they pontificate and they say this is what happened here this is what happened there. And then you get a whole group of young people who say, oh, that's what happened. And they move on and never question. And so it's boring. History could be boring to somebody because it's like, oh, well, they figured it all out. When really, there's so many cool things. They're just that scratching the surface. They're just scratching the surface. Mm -hmm. Even on things we take for granted as like common knowledge, it's still being debated. So, so there's a lot accurate, of things. How accurate mm -hmm. is carbon dating? It's pretty accurate. The, it's yeah, pretty accurate. The, I, it's pretty accurate. There are some you know inaccuracies or people who argue that it's not but i mean i think it's i think it's pretty accurate yeah well we do have it's another a... uh, question here from the chat room it's like really switching the subject but we're gonna <laughs> do it um and i do need to uh reiterate that we are uh 
simulcasting on Beyond the Light Network, and because of who this question's from, it reminded me of that. So <laughs> this question is from Chuck Banks, who heads up Beyond the Light Network. Uh, what does Dr. Heather think of the alleged faces on Mars? Oh, well, that's fascinating. Um, I'm going to come off as a real kook now. Yeah, um, so I think... Well, you've consulted on ancient <laughs> aliens, so, you know, let's, let's get uh, into well, it. Sure. Oh, consulted. Let me just say consulted. <laughs> <laughs> Whether they took my consultation, that's a whole other story. Right. But, <laughs> but, no, I think the faces on Mars, uh, clearly, if we don't even know what we have here, we can't even agree on things here. We don't know about the Sphinx. We cannot say anything for sure about Mars. We can't even date anything or whatever. However, I don't think there's any harm in, in uh, you know, some innocent speculation. I think that it could be something that might be. Why not? How do we know? So I personally think that there may be some truth to it. I don't know about the face per se, because yes, it looks like a face, but you know, there is a tendency for humans to pick up on anything right. that looks like faces, like Jesus is in your toast this morning and things like that. So, you know, <laughs> the kid on the faces bread. are yeah. the kid on the bread, you know, that kind of thing. But in the question of whether or not there was a civilization on Mars of, of something and that they built structures, I am so open to that. I, I personally believe that. Yeah, so whether uh, or not there's life on there now, you believe uh, that in the past or very well could have been? I believe in the, I believe in the past, yeah. I believe in the past there there probably was or could have been. But again, it's it still can only be, you know, speculation because we can't go up there and look and, and different things. So I'm open to, I wouldn't be so hard about it, like, oh, yes, this actually happened. But just as I wouldn't be so hard on other things that we have no way of proving <laughs> as of yet. As of, as yet, of yet, I mean, it's... We only have the, we're limited only by the tools that we have at the time. I mean, when people talked about germ theory before we could actually like, you know, test it, it would sound crazy. It would sound like, what are you talking about? There's these little like bugs and they get into you. And that sounds like, you know, the, the possessions and the things like that. Right. So it would sound preposterous until you had the tools necessary to measure and, and, and you know, observe. And so for that reason, I say, until we have the, the, the right tools to uh, disprove it or to prove it, I, I would say we need to at least maintain that it could be. Yeah. Hey, we so, have a uh, $10 super chat from Andrew Cox, his awesome guest. Thanks, Dr. Uh -huh. Heather. Let me hey, ask Andrew. you this real quick. Anunnaki, aliens or not? Hmm. That's a good one. Um, yes and no biological entities uh i don't think so um and i have a lot of reason for saying that and one of the reasons I, okay let, let me just say enter uh, this is going to sound kind of new agey but i think that they were definitely intelligent beings that they are not biological. Let's just say okay. that. Supernatural. I, 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 that's that's my yes. I guess you could call it that. Interdimensional. Um, and e, I guess if that's how you know the science would work it out, I'm not okay. real sure because I don't think we can study it. But I have the reason I believe that is not just you know sort of my own interpretation casually of the things I've read, but primarily because of um, some organizations that I have. Uh, I hesitate to say belonged to. Um, but some different people I've spoken with in my efforts to sort of, you know, get behind the scenes of what's been going on. And it's, it's something that even if I don't believe it, or it sounds kind of crazy to other people, there are people in great positions of power who not only believe it, but devote their lives to channeling these entities. And they refer to them as the watchers. They refer ah. to them by name and they channel them and they feed and and it, I, I, like I said, I'm very skeptical. I've not had many like kind of supernatural experiences, but I have to say, I have tried some of the methods that were told to me by somebody in a higher level of this organization. Um, you know, here, here's a, a method. Here's, you know, one of the ways to do this. And when I tried it, I thought, ah, it had to do with meditation and whatnot. And I'm like, all right, let's see. Usually if I meditate, it's like, I'm going to fall asleep. This is boring. You know, <laughs> as, un, as uncultured as that is, I just like, that's nah, just not for me. But when I did what they said to do, because I thought, oh, I got I got to experiment, uh, some really strange things happened, and it. Um, I have to say that I believe this changed my belief on a lot of different things, and it was a it was a pivotal moment where I think that we are conduits for some otherworldly messengers 
what they're made of, what they're like, I don't know. But there's something to it. And as much as I don't know about it at this point, there are people who do. And they're holding on to that knowledge. And they have direct contact with them. Or at least they believe they do. And at this point, after what I've experienced, um, I, you know, and this sounds very vague. And I guess I'm not really being as um, clear as I should be on it. But I, I, I can't necessarily at the moment um, <laughs> say exactly okay. who these people were and whatever. But I can just say that it's been my experience that there are a, uh, uh, there's a group of people out there who are actively channeling these beings who are getting information from them that are highly advanced like technology kind of information and that kind of thing and i've seen some things firsthand that that really just scared yeah. <laughs> i guess scared me you know <laughs> for lack okay. of better i'm not that brave it like kind of freaked me out and so i was like okay wait a second so whereas before i thought well maybe the anunnaki i don't know i thought maybe they would be like i didn't really believe so to speak. I, I, and now I thought, well, I don't, I still don't believe that they were biological um, in the sense that we would, you know, look at somebody and shake their hand. Okay. But I do believe, I do believe that they, I guess, are real and that they were, you know, <laughs> mankind's guides, if you will. Um, uh, um, yeah. I, I have to ask you something real quick before I lose my train of thought. Uh, based on what you just said a few minutes ago about how our you know, our limitations are basically, you know, limited by the tools that we have. Mm -hmm. Do you believe, feeling that and knowing that, do you believe that if the Library of Alexandria had never been destroyed, that we would be much more advanced th than we are today? Hmm. That's a good question. I've done a lot of research into the Library of Alexandria. It's funny, we, we talk about the... Um, you know, different ideas that are out there. That's that's one of those areas that's still being studied because we all want to believe it was burned down in some effort to hide knowledge when in fact it burned down. It didn't actually burn completely down and over time it just, you know, was it lacked funding and different things and it became a political tool to like say, you know, these people were to blame and these people were to blame and uh, it, no matter how it left, um, it's it, the information's gone. Some of it was actually sold because it didn't burn down in one fell swoop. Mm -hmm. So that's the important thing to take out of that is that they they saw the writing on the wall and they knew what information to take out of that and preserve and hide and what information could, you know, could just go. And uh, so I do think that you know, if we had access to that information um, and we could sort of, you know, get past our current uh, mindset and biases and understandings, we would be surprised at some of the things that we find. And so I, I don't know if it would have you know, manifested into some sort of, you know, great culture now. But I do think that as a result of losing the Library of Alexandria, we've lost some very important technological advances that we have no way of even, you know, they, they, they didn't even believe in the anti-Cathra mechanism. And, you know, if you're familiar with that, the, the people who found that, they were like, oh, this is amazing. This is, you know, the first computer. And they were like, hey, yeah, right. And they had to finally say, oh, well, this is what it is. And so that's just one of many things that you know could be out there and remember th a lot of very important artifacts and, and different tools like this they were only for the elite and they were very hard to come by and so there would only be one two three or maybe a handful of an existing period and so that means statistically they're more likely to be lost in time you know and just, I, yeah. I have to throw this out there real quick and then vanessa you can uh ask your question so imani abdella our friend from egypt says my profile pic on here is me at the library in Alexandria, Egypt. That's awesome. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's awesome. Flip on my phone to see. That is so amazing. Yeah, that's cool. It is an amazing. They've done such a beautiful job of, of now. Yeah, that's a beautiful it, library it, out there. Yeah. It's beautiful. And what they're trying to do is sort of recreate the, the spirit of the Library of Alexandria by having um, like the hub, like a database of just, you know, digital information. And so mm -hmm. they store a bunch of digital information there. And it's just it's really amazing. They've done a very good job with it. So well, the, the reason that I brought that up was based on what you had said previously, but also if we simplify that, mm -hmm. based on what you said about the Library of Alexandria and how it didn't burn down all in one fell swoop and that it was for the elite and that it was certain things more than likely were skirted away and kept for a certain section of society and, and not for everybody because heaven forbid everybody become knowledgeable. Is that similar in thought and in process to the same thing that happened with the Bible before it was translated, before Martin Luther went and put those 
those things on the door and was trying to educate the little man on what they were being taught because up to that point everything was still in Latin you know because right. it was the same mm -hmm. mindset it was the same mindset of we're going to tell you what you need to know but we're not going to teach you what you need to know and let you learn it for yourself and read right. it for yourself. is it the same type of concept and, uh, and what I, I think I think so I think it's sort of that idea of we're not going we're not going to teach you how to think we're going to teach you what to think. And that's We're going to give you a problem. fish, not to teach you to fish. Yes, exactly. And so I think, you know, because obviously it's all about control that way. And so, yeah. you know, so yeah, I do think that there is an element of that. And which which makes it even more uh, fascinating because what were they hiding? Then? Exactly. You know? Exactly. I mean, there have been uh, documented discussions and documentaries and and everything about the hieroglyphs. That, that you can see on the pyramids and how things are depicted, um, things that we have today that they would have absolutely no way of knowing that we were going to have those today thousands of years ago. Yet those images are there and are indisputable from my understanding, and I could be wrong. Um, but it's things like that are what makes me wonder, and I feel like as a society back then and now, it's more like, you know, if you bring a question forth and you want to learn about it, they're like, oh, no, shh, shh, shh. it's okay. Yeah. We got you. <laughs> that's, no, that's true. That's true. Now, um, you know, the academia is basically uh, all about compartmentalization. When you go in, you have to pick a, you know, major, which is understandable. From that point, you have to pick a, uh, all kinds of different things. You have to narrow it down to the point where if you look up, you know, um, di a different thesis or dissertation, it's going to be something so obscure, something so unrelatable. And it's, it's in an effort to, like, point you in this one direction so that you cannot see out of that. And, and that's the problem. I'm real big on interdisciplinary research. I think that we should pull from, you know, psychology and religion and, you know, anthropology and everything. We, you know, science, technology, all of this we need to put together. And we need to get together and we need to say, let's, let's, you know, we're thinking people. We need a holistic approach to the understanding of humanity's past, not leaving it in the hands of people who are really only concerned with, you know, making themselves relevant and having a job and then it's sad and, and you know and, and I don't I'm there are professors out there who are not that way but the sad truth is they're they're getting fired for you know adjuncts and substitute type teachers are taking their place and it's just one of those things where you know it's falling apart and they should just get out while they can and try to work for the betterment of humanity you know as opposed to just staying in an antiquated system like this well, taking a more holistic approach, like you say, wouldn't that help you to put into better context all this this history and these artifacts? Oh, I think absolutely, because currently what happens is the 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 bias is extraordinary. They you know they they focus a lot on teaching you to recognize certain lenses. They say you know you should look at this in through the lens of a feminist you know ideology or try looking at it through Marxist theory or how so there's all these critical theories. And it's like, how about looking, how about a little bit of freedom here to think? And that's, that's the thing. If you don't, if you don't do that, then, you know, well, you're not, you're not going to get the good opportunities or, you know, whatever. So it's sort of like, yes, we need to expand our minds and, and, and take off those lenses and, and try something else, you know, look at a kaleidoscope instead of the lens and see all the colors uh, yes. and, and see what's happening. Yes. You know, so I'm not all about these lenses and critical theory and all this. I think it's just a way to narrow the vision, narrow the field of vision to thinkers that should be opening their minds to the po the greater possibilities, even if it means challenging their own beliefs. My whole career thus far has been challenging what I already believe. I didn't believe in any kind of paranormal anything. I didn't believe in it. I've had to change. I've had to be open, and then along the way. I changed my beliefs because I learned something. And so we have to go in with an open mind and be, you know, uh, able to admit when maybe we were wrong or, hey, this is actually maybe a little like this. Or, you know, we, we have to be open and uh, creative, allow for creative, new and daring ideas. And do you think and, people and are sticking get, to the mantra that's been ingrained into us over all these years? 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I think so. And, and my, my favorite thing to remember is this. I try to remind people all the time. Napoleon said, what is history, he asked, but a fable agreed upon? Yeah. True. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it is that. It's, it's based on consensus. Because, again, there's not great hard science. There's not like a, a genetic test to say, yes, they meant this when they did that or they put – no. It, it's, it's foolish to think so. Most of history is the interpretation of this. Right. And so that's a little dangerous. As historians, you make history. You create the history. You, you make the narrative. It's a big responsibility. And unfortunately, you know, it can – it can be detrimental if you get it wrong. It can cause wars and, and, and all kinds of different problems. And so it's something that should really be, you know, taken as a great responsibility and uh, not just dished out like, you know, like we know everything already and don't dare question it. Or well, spoon fed. Yeah. Spin, well, absolutely. Let me ask you this. What can many of us do? I, I know that, you know, we have a chat room here with almost 50 mm -hmm. people watching. You know, a lot of us you know, read about all these different uh, fantastic historic locations, maybe artifacts are found, what have you, maybe we're watching documentaries, maybe we're going to historic places, you know, but we are kind of fed a, a line as we go along. Mm -hmm. So what can we do? You know, because I'm not an archaeologist. Um, I, I try to be a, <laughs> a ghost historian, a ghost historian in my own right. <laughs> I um, love ghost stories. Thank you. <laughs> you know, so you know, I, I try to uh -huh. dig in and research, you know, as, as best I can. But what can some of us really do? That's a really great question because so many times you hear, you know, this feeling of power, just feeling powerless. And, you know, so if I talk about big oil mining companies and global taxation firms, all this kind of nefarious business going on in a whole nother country. It's easy to just disregard it and say, well, I can't go over there. I can't do anything about it. You know, but that's, that's, that's what they want you to feel. It, it's, it's, they, they want you to enter into the apathetic and cynical mindset so that you can, you know, be robbed of your thoughts and and essentially robbed of the cultural heritage of the world. It's an effort to usher in a new dark age and keep humanity in the dark at the expense of usually struggling war-torn communities. Um, and, and so basically they want to hypnotize us into that sense of apathy and, and power, just feeling like, oh, what do I do? What do I do? So the answer is, you know, if you can't get over there and do something, which most of us, you know, can't, um, if you can't afford to do anything, which you know, unfortunately most of us can't, um, it's it's about the mindset. It's about breaking out of it. It's in, it's about waking up. And I know that term gets so thrown around. It's so cliche right now, but there is truth to it. Instead of sitting around and eating, you know, their bread and watching their circuses that they want us to, you know, consume, we need to get away from that and just wake up to this and, you know, fight in the ways that we can. So, you know, the first step is like deprogramming, I would say, to understand that you know, all of this is a, is, a, is a narrative and that it's okay to ask questions and push yourself, you know, and this is, this is, I think the best advice I could give on a practical level would be don't forget your local historical societies because they have no money. They, they don't, they're so a mess. In fact, they are being closed or actually scooped up by private corporations. Our, I, uh, worked for a local historical society recently as a volunteer um, to try to help them because all their archives were just, you know, dis disintegrating. Wow. They ended up having to sell most of their stuff, including land, so mm -hmm. they could be fracked for fracking. Wow. So what we're doing is we worry about ancient Egypt and all these great things, and that's, that's important. But what we can do as individuals is go to your local historical society and maybe just say, is there anything I can do to help? Chances are they'll say, yes, do you know how to web build a website? Or, yeah, do you know how to simply alphabetize something? Or, well, now that you mentioned it, can you dust the shelf? Little things like that make a big difference because otherwise they're closing. And with that, we lose our folk knowledge. And that's, you know, that's what they want us to do is just say, well, these are beyond, you know, this is beyond us. And so... Like Galileo once said, and I know I'm big on quotes, but Galileo <laughs> once said, all truths are easy to understand once they're discovered. The point is to discover them. So discovery is a necessary part of understanding the truth. So what we need to do is keep our minds open to discovery, understand the truth, wake up, and then get out there if you are so inclined 
to your local historical society, lend a helping hand, and try to preserve those documents because there are amazing things hidden in the local historical societies. And that's really the only way to learn. I, I can speak from experience. I've went to school in the South and in the Midwest. And even as, you know, it, as early as elementary school, it's a completely different history that you're taught. The history of the United States is completely different taught in Alabama than it is in Wichita, Kansas. Oh, absolutely. Everybody has their bias they inject into it. And it's, yep. it's a good thing to go in there and, and get into those archives. You're allowed to. They're public. You pay for them. Remember that, too. They belong to us. Mm -hmm. the, the, the local historical societies, museums, they are funded by the taxpayer, by us. They are our collective history. We own them. Therefore, we must take responsibility for them and make sure that they stay here for long after we're gone. Well, and let's, let's not forget our elderly as well. I mean, imagine the stories that are not oh, in yes. the book that you can yes. find out at your local nursing home or talking to the World War II vet sitting at the table next to you at your local diner. Engage in people. Broaden those horizons. Listen to these stories. File them back. Teach them to your children. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's actually... There's 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 programs out there you can volunteer for hospice care and different things where they do oral history projects so you can go there and they teach you how to do it with you know compassion and grace and you know the training necessary to handle that and you record their stories and so that's definitely a great idea is make sure you talk to people because that's where you find the best information Absolutely. from the first hand primary account yeah people that were actually there so yep. we are at our hour mark if you can believe that it goes by quick. <laughs> <laughs> we have to have her back on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, I love <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, Dr. Heather, it's been absolutely fantastic having you on. We're going to get to uh, some, some shout-outs here real quick, and then we will wrap up the show. In fact, um, Kathy Ciliento is throwing out there. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lynn. You're a rare artifact yourself. Great information. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Thank you for listening. So, all right, let's get to our Super Chat superstars. Tom McNicholas, Mickey Dole, Andrew Cox. Thank you all very much for the uh, Super Chats. So uh, I want to thank Donna Gorton for Cheshire Cat chatting the chat. Really do appreciate it down there and feeding me all the different uh, questions and uh, comments. So, um, all right, Sean Oldsmith, thank you for joining us from Australia tonight. Um, let's see, there's Betty Lange. Thank you, Betty. Uh, hey, um... I just want to throw out to you real quick. Check Twitter. For some reason, it seems like I'm disconnected from you on Twitter. I can't see your tweets or what have you for some strange reason. Um, BD Flint with a uh, $20 super chat here right at the end. Oh, thank gosh, you gosh. so much for a wonderful guest. Well, thank you, BD, one of our Deep Down the Rabbit Hole Patreon patrons. Really appreciate that. Um, okay, other shout outs. Uh, Zippy Davis, Discord Threads. Thank you very much. Uh, Spooky Dawn. Really appreciate it. Joe Chandler, thanks for joining us again tonight. And there's Andrew Cox. There's ben Bonnie Halper and our other uh, Cheshire cat. Uh, Jill Nemchinski, thank you very much for joining us again. And the Hagland, thank you as well. There's Diane Hilbert. Hey, I'll be seeing you this coming week in Ocean State Paracon. Uh, Pungai Fungi. <laughs> the name I love to say <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. Trisha Ugly, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, we had a lot of you in chat tonight. So, uh, Imani Abdella, thank you for joining us from Egypt. Really do appreciate that. Uh, Katie Palmer, thank you as well. Chip Terry, thank you. Imla Buddha 61 thank you for joining us tonight. Um, who else do we have? Beat3 Airspace, thank you as well. Tammy Heitzman, thanks for joining us. Sorry you didn't get the notification. White, White Rabbit notif Notification Squad, just uh, hit those shares at the very beginning. So, uh, those that don't get the notification for some reason, do. Uh, Beyond the Light Network, Chuck Banks, thank you. We were uh, simulcasting there on Beyond the Light Network and also down on Periscope. So I want to thank those networks. And there's Candy Orton. Thanks for joining us again tonight. Always appreciate uh, your feedback there in the chat, of course. Uh, Greg Rankin, uh, thank you as well. Uh, we did have a lot of you in here tonight. Had a lot. Yeah, Beth there. Bethany Warner. <laughs> yeah, they, and they were having some great chat going on as well. And uh, X Group Home Kid, thank you for joining us again. And I just flew by somebody and I lost it. Um, there's Tom McNicholas. And all right, I'm going to scroll back down. Anybody that wants a last minute shout out, go ahead and throw it in there. I know there's a little bit of a delay. So uh, we'll do that here. And um, yeah, Jill <laughs> says I'm awesome. I can pronounce her last name. 
Um, all right, so uh, yeah, so all right, um, and there's Kathy Salento. I think I already said yeah. Kathy was the one that yeah. let it off. Um, okay. Let me tell Heather real quick. Sure. If I am up in your area, Heather, anytime soon, you must take me out. I, yeah. I would <laughs> love it. Please I want, do. I want to go dig with you. Okay. I, I want to take you to the pyramid. I, I found yeah. something I really need to like. You know. I, yeah. Come on, let's do this. <laughs> I would love to. Yeah. I would love to. And there's Heather down in chat and Samuel Hall. So where can everybody find you? Find your books. I know that was a question earlier on. Um, you have Evil Archaeology that's coming out here. I guess it's a uh, second edition. Is it's yeah, it's going to be um, second edition. It was picked up by a larger publisher. I'm very grateful to New Page Publishing. I have to say because Amazon, as I mentioned, has they've been giving me a hard time. I, I hear they give a lot of indie authors hard, you know difficult times nowadays um, for various reasons. But uh, thankfully, a New Page came in and said I can. They will publish what I have to say uncensored. And I was like, really? That seems so uh, okay. And so I got that in writing. That's that's <laughs> contract. I can have everything I want out there. And so that's exciting. So yes, unfortunately, there's still a little bit of a wait for evil archaeology as a result. Um, but uh, for anyone who wants to know, you know, updates or any of my information, they can go to my website. It's www.drheatherlynn.com. They can sign up for my newsletter, see my YouTube. I have uh, a show that I do. Um, it's part you know, storytelling part lecture. It's called Digging Deeper, and that's on my YouTube as well. And so, yeah, yeah your first episode was on the Templars, which I thought was very cool. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I discussed that, and so I had to take a little bit of a break. On, and uh, so the next one is coming out in um, the first of the month. I'm gonna, I have some loaded and ready to go. So there'll be like a drop of like three episodes coming up um in august so I look you know but and basically <laughs> <laughs> any, any <laughs> the um you can find me at my website that's the best thing just go right to the website there's like kind of a hub and there's archaeology news and updates and all kinds of fun stuff and my social media and stuff like that so yeah, you throw a lot emails. of you throw a lot of updates out onto your uh, facebook page as well I, well, I, I do. I throw a lot of jokes out there, too, sometimes. <laughs> i got to keep people laughing in this difficult time, you know. <laughs> so, right. But, yes. Um, so, yeah, you know, come find me and, you know, we'll stay in touch. And definitely, if anybody has any questions or cool leads or anything they want to talk about, feel free to always email me, too. I do respond to my emails. Okay. A couple last-second shout-outs. Uh, Shay Carroll, Nellie Moen, and Tracy Christian. Thank you all very much. So, again, uh, Dr. Heather Lynn, thank you very much for joining us tonight. We'll definitely have to do it again. So. Oh, yes. Yeah, I was really looking forward to, to this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. It's been so great talking to you, and I really look forward to coming on again. Absolutely. All right, everybody. Um, stay tuned. We have Inside the Upside Down coming up here um, when about... 10, 15 minutes after this show wraps up, we're going to be talking about first paranormal experiences. Not just mine, but yours as well, if I don't get caught <laughs> up in my own uh, wires here. All right, everybody. So we'll see you soon. And again, Dr. Heather, thank you very much. So till next thank time. You. Till next Bye. time. Mm -hmm.